It is so good to see you ladies on the couch, on the virtual couch today. I'm so excited because we have Dr. T and Dr. T and Dr. T. Oh my gosh. Okay, let's talk about it. We're going to talk about that another time, okay? We have all docs on the couch this evening. We are so excited to have Dr. Black on the couch with us this evening, who is has her doctorate in psychology, but is also a licensed marriage and family therapist. So she's going to lay down some truths this evening for us about relationships and trust. So Ladies, this is what happened. So lately, I've been reading a lot of information talking about the sort of evolution of relationships today. Y'all millennials, y'all be doing a whole lot in Gen Z's, but I'm not going to talk about y'all this evening. We're going to talk about the problem. So a lot of people are saying that they are trending away from monogamous relationship. And in fact, as one survey said, um, they surveyed about 1,300 uh, U.S. adults. And 32% said that their ideal relationship is non-monogamous to some degree. So we're going to talk about it because these, this sort of new dynamics of relationships or the emerging of these dynamics of relationships really bring to you question, how do we define trust? How do we trust one another? And one of the conversations that I saw on social media recently was a conversation about where people were disagreeing about sharing the passwords with your partner. So let's talk about it. First of all, ladies, um, how do you think, like, how do we define trust in relationships? What does that look like? How do we know if we have a trustworthy relationship? Yeah, so, you know. <laughs> Dr. Dr. Tris is like, I'm a hold on that, on that end, but we gonna come to you because you're, you're married. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's a, an important question. And I really think trust and the definition of trust and the way we actually navigate trust depends on the individual. Yes. And what I mean by that is our ability to trust or communicate or attach really develops at a very, very young age. And sometimes we actually take either the capacity to trust or mistrust beyond our developmental years and it begins to act out in adult relationships. So when we think about trust, we have to actually really look at the individual or the couple that we're looking at, right? What does trust look like and feel like? What does that mean for me? What is my experiences with trust and mistrust and even betrayal, right? Mm. And yeah, so I'll, I'll pause there, but. <laughs> oh, no, you can keep going because I'm about to take notes for myself. <laughs> okay, so one of the things you mentioned that I like that you brought up is this imprinting of how we Mm -hmm. trust people starts really early. How early are we talking? Oh, yes. So I would say it actually happens and develops between the age of zero and three. Wow. That early. And that's why the nurturing relationship, the mirroring, right, of affect, of feelings, right, mm -hmm. of a predictable um, parental relationship, whether it's the natural mother or not, the predictability, the seeking safety aspect has to be met at a very young age. Oh. Yeah. So that's that, earlier than I would have thought. That's yeah. really, that's right out the womb, literally. Yes, absolutely. And that's why I don't think we give infants the, the respect mm -hmm. <laughs> and the acknowledgement that they need because those early formative years, the feeling, right, the predictability when babies look around and try to see where mommy and daddy is, sometimes when we don't get those attachments, we don't get that security played out, there's the internal, uh, I would say, kind of fragility that we hold, those early experiences with feeling isolated, with feeling that I have to rely on myself, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there's a lot of factors that really happen in a very, very early years of our life. That's so interesting. And I'm glad that you're mentioning this because I would definitely say for my women, um, I do, one of the things I evaluate in their not just their postpartum period, but during their pregnancy is their ability to bond with the baby. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of times we underestimate um, the impact of prior trauma, prior pregnancy experiences, 
um, and how it defines a woman's ability to bond with her child. But I do think bonding should be a medical evaluation because as you are now confirming, if mom is not bonding with the baby because she had a hard pregnancy or perhaps a prior pregnancy that was traumatic, um, that the inability to bond with that child can then affect what sounds like can then affect that child's ability to develop and understand trust and understanding belonging um, and understand, you know, relationships. So that's a very, very interesting point. I like the other point that you mentioned about um, defining trust as a couple. So each understanding that each couple have a different definition of what trust looks like as an individual and also mm -hmm. as a couple. So Dr. Trace, I'm going to ask you this question, like, how did you and your hubby, <laughs> did you have conversations about trust? And what, what do those conversations sound like? Or just in general, like, what have your experience have been like? Um, I don't know if to say that we had a straight out conversation about trust, but what I would say is um, it becomes that kind of relation. When you, when you start off as friends and then you go into a relationship, you tend to have a period of time where you start to be able to feel a little bit more comfortable. I will say that I, I trusted him. I trusted him from the very beginning, whether I was just being, I don't know what. I didn't see him as a potential partner. I saw him mm -hmm. as a brother, but um, I, he, in, he inspired trust in me. Um, and I think it was, you know, my, my looking at his demeanor, the way he kind of carried himself or whatever the case may be. You know, it wasn't just his pretty good looks. You know, it was a little bit more than that. It was a little substantive. But mm. um, I can't say that we've necessarily had conversations that talked about what, look, what trust looks like per se, but more um, maybe what the expectations are and the roles, I guess, um, between us in terms of... Um, who, you know, who's going to work, who's going to be at home or, or some of those things. So there's certain aspects of it that um, kind of flowed naturally, I would say. Um, we did do like premarital counseling through our church and we had to go through a series of that sort of stuff. But um, in terms of trust, I, I would honestly say there hasn't been a, a specific dialogue surrounding that, so to speak. Mm -hmm. It kind of just evolved. It sounds like like your relationship yeah. evolved, and so yeah, um, this unsaid trust happened as a result it of the evolution. Yes, um, it built. Dr. Black, should we be having conversations about trust? About um, or should we? Should it just evolve? Should you? Should there be an actual intentional conversation about boundaries in a relationship? About trust? Like, how should we approach that? Sure, sure. So. I would say communication is the number one formula for so many, <laughs> for so many reasons. And yes, you should have uncomfortable conversations on boundary setting, on triggers in regards to trust, past relationships, relationships with parents, experiences especially in the beginning of the relationship, I think it's an important time to really know who you are and the fi family dynamics you came from, understand your own experiences and be able to have a proper mature <laughs> conversation mm -hmm. with your partner about this is what resonates with me. This is what makes me safe. This is what makes me feel a little bit vulnerable. These are some repetitions that I've seen in my parents. And this is mm -hmm. how I see my family and my marriage or partnership moving forward. And to be able to really understand your partner's background, we can actually put our stories more succinctly together. So I think not only in the beginning of the relationship, but have check-ins mm -hmm. during the developmental phase as you actually grow and merge lives together. It's a continual conversation, but a level of vulnerability and knowing of one another. Okay, okay. And, and when you are, should you feel like you need to or have to get to the point where you can share the password to your phone? Like, is that the goal? Is the goal that you're able to get to that point that there is some type of marker, there is some type of benchmark that says, 
okay, now we truly trust each other. Do we have to get there? That's a good question. (laughs) (laughs) I really do wonder. I really do wonder, like, you know, some people find that that's a goal. Like some people really, they kind of find that to be celebratory. Like, oh yeah, I can. And I'll tell y'all where this comes from. I will, I will be transparent with y'all. I watch Sisters on BT. Yes, I do. I watch it. And there was an episode (laughs) where the two characters and I do their, their relationship is a little interesting. The dynamics are interesting, but I'm feeling them. I'm loving the couple. And she tricked him into sharing his password. Now, granted, he's had tumultuous relationships and issues in the past, and he's really, really feeling this woman, developing a beautiful relationship. I know it's a character, but follow me with this. And (laughs) they were in a moment where it seemed like, wow, like we've reached this benchmark. We are about to share our passwords. Like this is major. And they actually said that the character said, this is major, like we're sharing our passwords. And this does happen in real life where people do feel like getting to the point of sharing, um, whether it's sharing a home, like moving in together, um, sharing bank account information, sharing passwords. These are sort of milestones that a lot of people look to it to, to, to say that, wow, like our relationship has gotten there. Like we've gotten to that point of trust. Should we have these benchmarks? Yeah. So (laughs) (laughs) what I would defer to is that every couple is different, but it does seem like we're asking for more access to our partners outside of the relationship. And what I mean by that is we live in a world where it's so much packed into this one little phone. Yes. <laughs> and sometimes that little phone can be a point of curiosity to your partner, right? And couples that I work with and couples that I know, usually the exchanging of passwords usually happens naturally, right? Mm, mm -hmm. And when I see the question come up, you know, can I have your password? Let me check your phone. It really points to an earlier incident or experience (laughs) that may need to actually be worked through. Yes. Gotcha. Oh, that's such a great point. Wait, can we pause there? So you're basically saying if you have to request the password, as opposed to it voluntarily be given to you? Mm-hmm. Yes. That, that may be an indication that there is some underlying issue that's leading to the request for the password. Whereas for healthy relationships or healthier relationships, um, there's a natural evolution that you may naturally just give the your partner the password without actually having a request uh, or feeling like pressured to do so that it's a natural evolution of the relationship itself. Is that what you're saying? Yes, yes. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. That's interesting. Okay, okay. And so how does this play into, because now we have a multitude of dynamics and not everybody's monogamous. And we have polyamorous relationships where the dynamics are real, I, I don't even understand them. That's why we have Dr. Black on the couch because Lord knows I need to take some notes. I don't understand what folks are doing nowadays. I'm not going to pretend that I understand, but I, 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 I get that people are looking for other types of relationships, open relationships. Um, so how do you maneuver trust in an open relationship, in a polyamorous relationship? And just for our viewers, we talked about polyamorous relationships and open relationships on a previous, on a previous episode. And Um, we had a variety of definitions, but in general, open relationships is that the two partners are together as a primary unit and they can have additional relationships agreed upon outside of that, that central relationship. And that could be, you know, all different types of levels as defined by the couple. And Dr. Black, please correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know what the technical definition is, but this was the layman's definition that we had on the couch that time. And then the polyamorous relationship was, Basically, it's not a central couple unit. It is individuals who may be a, th- a truple, like a, a three-way relationship. So 
each individual. So the core of the relationship are multiple people and multiple people have very intimate relationship, not necessarily sexually intimate all the time, but some level of intimacy in a multi, in the, I can't even explain, different people in the relationship. The, y'all understand what I'm saying? I'm, I'm sorry if I was, I'm trying to work through it for y'all. I'm trying to, I'm trying to explain these dynamics to y'all, but basically you can have three people in a relationship of various genders uh, or or non-conforming genders, and they have relationship with both individual and they are both solid relationships. They're they're viewed as solid relationships in a trouble. Now, I can't really explain polyamorous versus a trouble. The only thing I understand is that polyamorous could be even more than the three people and a trouble is three people. That's as much as I got for y'all. Okay, Dr. Black, help me out. <laughs> you know, I, you, you got the gist of it. And, you know, <laughs> that was hard. Yeah, but, you know, I would say the world that we're living in now, there's so many different expressions of relationships. But, you know, what I observe in relationships where it's more than one partner, there's actually more of a level of trust within those relationships than monogamy. What? Okay, she just dropped the bomb. Okay, please explain that. (laughs) (laughs) that. Yeah, yeah. so, and a... uh, polygamous relationship or in a relationship where someone may have a second wife or second husband per se, there's an agreement and knowing, and there's an entire system. I I would say for lack of a word, a a respect among the persons, it's kind of like a contract, right? Mm -hmm. That they're actually letting other people into the polygamy circle that everyone is aware of. So there's predictability, but also there's no need to actually, you know, hide or be guarded at all because there is an agreement that we're open. And this is the person that I'm going to be with today. Right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So that knowing actually positions people in polygamy in a more trusting, open, more fluid relationship than someone in a monogamous relationship where there's a lot of, um, I would say, a lot of vulnerability to put your trust into one person. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm in expecting them to have a monogamous relationship. So there is a higher calling in a monogamous relationship than there is in polygamy. There's more of a risk in monogamy than Mm. polygamy. And that's why it's harder. Yes. Gotcha, gotcha. That's so interesting because a lot of people that I've heard on platforms talk about these diversities of relationships have, have often said, that they felt that in these other types of relationships that they would be jealous, that they would have a hard time being okay with um, with um, those types of dynamics. But I guess what you're saying to a certain degree also is understanding what you're comfortable with and what type of relationships is, is a match for you. And there are people who are very comfortable, even though for those of us who want a monogamous relationship, um looking at those types of relationship we can't really some of us can't really comprehend that type of of dynamics but the people who are in them and love them and desire them they don't have a problem it sounds like with trust they're not walking around being jealous that's what it sounds like to me yeah well there there's always a texture of jealousy right because Mm -hmm. they're all still human (laughs) no matter Mm -hmm. what relationship they're in Mm -hmm. but there's an agreement and an allowance right there's a respectability there that is within a polygamy community that may not be present in a monogamous relationship to get in out of a monogamous relationship you literally have to separate (laughs) from that person in order to kind of partner with someone else in polygamy it's there's some freedom to step in and out as you like I don't know if that that provides more clarity no it did no 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 that it definitely did so what do you say to people who have issues with jealousy what is jealousy is jealousy bad it's because I've heard some people say or I was listening to something recently where they were saying jealousy is not a negative thing I've always grown up knowing that jealousy is a negative attribute 
So is jealousy bad? Is it, is it negative or is it a natural response in relationships? How do we, how do we understand jealousy? Yeah, so I think the feeling of jealousy is not negative in its own right, but mm -hmm. it's what the person does with it. Right. 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 And there's a healthy level of jealousy because that indicates care, attachment, right. connection, right? A longing just to kind of be the primary person in their life. So it's hurtful sometimes to see that desire, you know, outside of whatever relationship you exist in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But some people can just kind of handle it and talk about it a little more than others. But I think in every relationship, there there's a sense of protection. Jealousy can look like protection as well. Yeah. That's interesting. A quick question or whatever, uh -huh. double black. Um, what about attachment styles in these uh, polyamorous or poly are we finding that there is less of an attachment in the relationships? Hmm. Yeah. So I don't want to get in trouble here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. No, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Create your boundary. Your yes, we believe in healthy boundaries, so you define your boundaries. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, but I, I will say you're spot on. Um, I think attachment has definitely something to do with it. Um, the first thing that I really look at with someone that's kind of a serial dater or, mm -hmm. or someone that prefer more than one partner is I, I look at their relationship with parents, right? But also the fear underneath the fear of dependency, the fear of need, right? The, uh, sometimes being in a committed relationship makes the person feel trapped and mm -hmm. fragile, right? Some mm -hmm. people don't have a blueprint of feeling like wanted and secure. Um, so there's all different type of dynamics, but so, there is a point of curiosity and you're definitely right because you have secure attachment styles. You have anxious avoidant attachment styles right. that that's the person that wants to come close, but once you far away at the same right. time, right, right. Mm -hmm. um, then you have disorganized attachment styles, right? So all of that plays out, but we can actually really look at the way people navigate relationships and we can actually find the same repetitions in other areas in their life. Oh, that's interesting. So what work, um, thank you for that. That that's, was a really, really good question. Um, and thank you for that response. It makes me think of when you talk about um, how sort of our, how we navigate in our relationships and what that says about also other areas in our life. What work can we do if we are in that phase in our life where we're ready for a relationship? Uh, what work should we do? Or is there any work we should do ahead of time? Or should we wait for that relationship to help define, you know, help us define where we should be? Or is there emotional work we should do ahead of time? Perhaps looking at prior relationships and, and eval perhaps going sitting on your couch and evaluating where we are in terms of our trust level before getting in a relationship or should we wait for the relationship because each relationship is so different? Yeah, you know, that, that's a really good question. I would say whatever position you're in, whether you're in a relationship or not, but seeking relationship in the future, I think it's always a good time to check in and mm -hmm. really kind of reflect on what have your relationships looked like from your parents, from your siblings, right? Even from authority, right? Because mm -hmm. if you have some conflict with, you know, authority, then you're going to probably have a conflict with commitment and coming home and answering to your wife, right? Oh, <laughs> right? that's so, yeah. really 
understand your story, right? Mm -hmm. And you don't have to do this deep reflective work, but just take a moment to look at your past relationships. What did they look like? What did they feel like? And where are you right now? Because there are repetitions. There are reasons why we attract certain partners than others, consciously and unconsciously. So I would say just really reflect understand your own story. I also recommend a really good book. I'm pretty sure you ladies know about it. It's called Attached, right? And I believe- I don't know that book. <laughs> okay, oh. I'm writing it down. <laughs> I'm expect some notes. Yeah. I Attached, need notes you know version. what? Definitely text me the, the information and I will post it with this video. I got you ladies. Awesome. You single folks out there, I'm asking for a friend. Well, not really, kind of, sort of. I'm asking for a friend so that you guys can have the 411. So I will get the info for you ladies and I will check out our, our, our information with this video and you will have the information for the book. Okay, I got y'all, I got y'all. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so I'll send that right over to you, but it's um, by Dr. Adam Levine, I believe. And I so know that name. Maybe I do know this book, but clearly I didn't read it. It must be on my shelf with all the other <laughs> books I didn't read. <laughs> yeah, so mm. it, it's a really good guide. And sometimes I recommend that to some of my patients as well. And we'll just kind of work through what, what they're discovering about themselves. But you would begin to actually map out your own attachment styles and see the cycles and repetitions, right? Sometimes we have imprints on our mind based on gen our genetic family line, right? That some things are normal in, in one relationship and may be abnormal in another. So really try to understand that. And the more and more you understand your attachment style, you'll be able to not see it only in romantic relationships, mm -hmm. but other relationships as well. Yeah. That's good to know. I can, I can definitely, I can definitely see what you're saying as I'm like playing yes. my own relationships in my head. I'm like, yes. Ooh, we may have to do some work. So at one yes. point, <laughs> <laughs> oh, we all, we all going to need her card when we're done. Are you taking it? Yes. <laughs> um, but, but, but at what point though, I know you said it doesn't have to be necessarily anything too deep. Um, but at what point should we come sit on your couch? At what point should an individual, you know, if we're doing sort of this groundwork and we're realizing certain patterns, what patterns should be alarming to us that requires it to then seek some additional professional help? Yeah. So I would say if the way that you're navigating relationships creates a sense of self-harm, right? or lack of pleasure in life. And this is something that, that deeply, that wake, keeps you up in, in, at night or something that keeps happening over and over again. And I, I really try to help patients, especially who have experienced trauma, right? Mm -hmm. To really, really understand how the trauma is being played out in the partner selection, right? whether we get into cycles of kind of abuse, right? Verbal abuse or physical abuse in relationship. And it seems to be the same type of person or it seems to be the same type of person that I'm attracting a disorganized attachment style to, right? right. Mm -hmm. So if I'm feeling insecure and I attach myself to an insecure person, then that's gonna actually keep me in a position of being brokenhearted and insecure as well, right? Mm. So we usually play back the narrative that we believe deep inside of us. So I would say if it's causing you harm, if you're a person that absolutely wants to be a wife, right? And you just really can't. <laughs> yes, <laughs> just I letting can't. my viewers know, just letting y'all know. <laughs> yes, and I will say it, it, it's definitely other factors. This is layered. This is just one small part of what mm -hmm. may be missing is the understanding of the person that we're looking for in regards to partnering. So any dissatisfaction, if you are looking for a relationship, if you're looking for a deeper, healthier attachment, yes, it, it's time to actually self-reflect and look at your patterns. Wow, you get, you ladies heard it here first. Look at your patterns, okay? And one of the things I before we go, I 
I do want to touch on the trauma portion of it because I think oftentimes we think of trauma as resulting in violent and aggressive behavior and aggressive type relationships. Are there other manifestations of trauma? Does trauma look, you know, what's the sort of spectrum of how trauma can sometimes impact relationships and look in our relationship? Yeah, you know, that's a really good question because one of the traumas that is hardly acknowledged and spoken of is emotional abandonment. Oh, she just stepped in my backyard. Okay, let's talk about it. <laughs> yes. So this goes back to our attachment at a very early age, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes if we don't get the imprint that we're cared for, we don't have someone actually marrying our emotions, whether it's sadness, happiness, whether we feel that we don't have anyone to turn to, spend a lot of time in isolation or couldn't really bring or have your full emotional life within your genetic family dynamic that causes you to actually go inward right and there's a trauma there's a deep knowing that i cannot have my own emotions so if you do have that blueprint you're going to probably project that blueprint into an adult relationship and end up with someone that actually reflects back that emotional abandonment. I hear it all the time. I don't feel connected to my husband, right? He leaves without telling me, right? <laughs> he mm -hmm. just doesn't answer. He, I tell him something and there's nothing back. It's like I'm talking to a wall. That is that repetition of emotional abandonment. And we have to actually give that acknowledgement that that is a sort of trauma. Wow, that's interesting. So let me let me replay this because I want to make sure I'm, I'm fully understanding because this is really deep. So you're saying that emotional abandonment or some type of trauma, you can then select partners that kind of replay that same type of trauma that you experienced? Absolutely. Yeah. We're going to let y'all sit on that because she doesn't <laughs> fed us not an appetizer, not just the meal, but the appetizer, the meal and the dessert. OK, <laughs> so I want you ladies to sit on your couches, replay this a couple of times <laughs> as I'm about to do. OK, um, because that is some. <laughs> Let me tell you, true bombs just dropped. Okay. So thank you, yeah, Dr. Dr. Black. Black. Let me tell you, you left us oh, with yeah. some homework. We are all going to yep. do our homework. And then <laughs> yes. you know, if she's taking new clients, I will let y'all know. Don't yes. bombard her right now. <laughs> but if they just want to follow and see how you're doing, Dr. Black, where can they find you? Sure. Well, if you want more information or resources or referrals, um, you may contact me at therapy at drtamilapractice.com. That's my email address. And I'm not so much on social media, but I do have a website, um, drtamilapractice.com. Or you can actually reach out to Dr. Tasca. <laughs> Absolutely. So you guys got it. She gave you her email and she gave you her website. Make sure you write that down. If not for yourself, for one of your girlfriends, one of your sisters, for your aunt, your uncle, whomever, write down her information. Okay. Cause she just laid down some facts, some facts. And I know, I know, I know, I know that y'all can use this information. Okay. I'm not shading. I'm just saying, I'm just sharing, asking for a friend, right? Asking for friends. Asking for friend. Dr. The other Dr. T, Dr. Trista, where can they find you and your wonderful hubby? How can they contact you? <laughs> I don't know if you're going to see him, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm at trissajob.dpt on Instagram. Awesome. And I am Dr. T, the hand behind the handle of Healthy Bump Club. We thank you for following us. We thank you for watching this video. Definitely check out our other video. If you want to check out our polyamorous video, it's, it's quite interesting. <laughs> And then come back to this video and get some facts, okay? Um, but definitely check out our other videos. Make sure you follow us here on YouTube. If you haven't subscribed, make sure you subscribe. If you haven't liked, make sure you liked. If you haven't shared, go ahead and share this information. Don't keep it to yourself. We are a community. And when you're done with YouTube, hop on over to Instagram. You'll find us at healthybump.club on Instagram. 
and you'll see all of our short videos. You're going to see clips of this particular video also. Um, so make sure you share with a friend, share with an aunt, share, share with a, a girlfriend, whomever. Just make sure you don't keep this solid information to yourself. And we look forward to seeing you on the next episode. We'll see you guys. Have a wonderful, wonderful week, weekend, depending on when you're watching this video. But we'll see you definitely on the couch next episode. Bye, y'all.